just excited about this message too. In fact, if you want to look at your sermon outline, if you're watching online, welcome. You can also get the notes there. And we're wrapping up a series we've been teaching on called Weird, Being God's New Normal. And, and the heart of this has been the challenge about what it means to be radically different in this world so we can experience God's peace and make our biggest difference. And I feel like this is more important than it has ever been because one of the things we're noticing, surveys and other things tell us that in a lot of areas, when it comes to things like divorce rates or, or addictions, what they're finding is that there's not that much difference between those who call themselves Christians and, and those who, who don't know the Lord yet. That somehow the world, the normal of the world, has, has kind of started to fit people too much in their mode. And I believe God's saying at this time, it's time to be different. Amen? I liked a little poster I had at one time that said, if they put you on trial for being a radical Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> is there enough different about your life? And, and I believe this is a heart that, that we have been trying to say, that Paul said, don't conform to the world, <laughs> but be transformed, be totally, I love to call it the God kind of weird, <laughs> because that's how you're gonna feel the fullness of God's plan for your life. And so one of the areas and as we move towards Lent, you know, we know that all around the world, Christians are, are studying about the cross and the suffering of Jesus and what it means. And one area that if you really live out is that'll make you seem weird to the world is the area of the belief that God has called us to share in Christ's suffering. That suffering and sacrifice are part of the road to victory. I know this doesn't sound too exciting, <laughs> but that actually... One of the most important truths is that we must bear the cross if we want to wear the crown. There's an amazing crown, but everywhere you get the crown, there's also a cross. And in the world, you know, you hear all the time, uh, have it your way, but God says, unless you deny yourself. <laughs> the world just teaches us, you know, fight for your rights, and, the, and God says, lose your life. I mean, it's just radically different. And for us, we know it's difficult because we live in a very consumer, entitlement culture, right? I mean, we have Uber Eats. You don't even have to get out of your pajamas. I mean, we've got Amazon. I mean, it's, it's easy. Uh, you know, I was just kind of joking about this that I thought of three of the things that really frustrated me this week, and I wondered what my persecuted Christian friends overseas would think. You know, I said, I went through Starbucks and my coffee was too cold. Oh my God. <laughs> my microwave stopped working. Oh, when we got the pickup from Walmart, some of my potato chips got smashed. <laughs> Poor pastor. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is we live in a country where there's more luxury and comfort than any nation in history. So what does that do to us? That makes us think it should be easy. Being a Christian, I should have microwave blessings. <laughs> I should be able to go one, two, three. Everything's perfect. Don't tell me about suffering. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches, yes, you can have every blessing of God, but there is a price. And that price is, is good to pay. Because of what it does. I thought of this verse, Acts 5.41. And I thought of how weird this scripture might seem. You know, the apostles had been preaching and they got totally persecuted. They were stripped. They were beaten in public. They were mocked. But look at their reaction. It says, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to, dis to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. How many say, that's weird, right? If it was us, we'd have sued the pants off those guys, right? <laughs> but here they are. Whoa. It's a privilege. Do you realize that this year, at least 250,000 brothers and sisters in other countries will choose to die rather than to deny their faith in Jesus? That's a, a very conservative estimate. Have you ever thought about that? Well over a million will lose their homes, will be put in prison. You see, 
Around the world, people think and they say, Jesus, it's awesome to be able to even think I could suffer for you. And beyond that, we have missionaries. You know, even I think of my own kids, Heidi and Chris, they'll go to Zambia. There's, you know, they're not going to have electricity for hours and most every day and it's hard and, and thousands of others. And they do it just so someone could have a chance to find Jesus. And people say, ooh, that's weird. Other Christians are completely socially isolated because they won't participate in the ways of the world. But it's okay because they want to stand up for God. Other Christians, they sacrifice, they, they lay their life down to serve people. This is what the heart of Christianity is. It's so good, it's worth dying for. I think this verse in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 9 to 12 really describes the, the perspective of the church in ancient times of what it meant to be a Christian. Look what Paul says. He says, and because I preach the good news, I am suffering and have been chained like a criminal. But the word of God cannot be changed, chained. So I'm willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? I'm willing to do any, endure anything that God has chosen. This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign. Isn't this interesting? He says, do you want to reign? You reign through suffering with him. See, some people don't like that verse. You know? <laughs> I want to reign. Okay, suffer. Okay, whoa, maybe I don't want to reign. I don't know. If we deny him, he will deny us. Now, what I want you to hear today is that suffering and, and sacrifice is not only inevitable in this world, but it's pivotal to a life of victory. It's learning how to walk through those times that allows God to produce his character in you. I like to say the crazy weird thing about Christians is when we go through our worst, we can come out our best. When we have sacrificed the most, we receive the most. When we lose the most, we gain the most. This is the gospel, that the way to the crown is always the cross. If we embrace the cross like Jesus did, we receive the glory. And, and what I want to share that uh, reasons why this is so important is because many of you and us, we've gone through suffering this year. And, and some of us, it's been the hardest year of our life. And, and I believe if we don't understand what the Bible teaches about suffering, we won't recover the way God wants us to recover. We'll get stuck in that. Um, it is true, absolutely true, that what ruins one person raises another person. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, right now in our world, people are, go, are responding three different ways. And I don't want to minimize how horrible people have died. I don't want to minimize anything. But I want you to know that people have responded differently. Some have sunk, some have barely survived, and some are soaring. And that's the way it always is during hard times. Some people just lose their faith. Some people just survive, you know what I mean? I mean, they're, they're breathing, but they're kind of spiritual zombies. Ever met one of those? <laughs> oh, I, 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 yeah. You know, they look like they just got baptized in pickle juice or whatever. And they're saying, I'm serving the Lord, uh, you know. Yeah, it looks like you got gallstone problem, but it's okay. But there are some Christians that even in the hardest times, they rise up. I mentioned in a testament two weeks ago, Sister Andrea, who lost so much during this time, but she came to this decision of God. God has so touched her that she's already touched 10 family members there in church. She's having revival. I said, wait a second. What's going on? She says, it's just that the God, I've let God take everything in my life and I'm just like soaring. You see, it's not what happens to you. It's what you choose inside of you. And what I, what I believe is that God wants to use this time to raise up the champion in all of us to absolutely create a comeback for our lives. You know, one of the most interesting things, do you know when the church of Jesus in history 
has grown the most? It was when it was persecuted the most. I know this is crazy, but the times, I like that verse in Exodus 1.12. It says, the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. <laughs> They're like dandelions, you know? Smash a dandelion and pfft, just went everywhere. You know, don't feel bad when the church is persecuted. Feel bad when the church is popular because it's like the world. That's when we're in trouble. But when people begin to see, yes, there is a cost, and I'm going to pay it, then all of a sudden, they don't just survive. They just begin to thrive in an incredible way. Um, the crowning example of this is Jesus himself, right? No one has suffered greater, and no one has risen higher. And Jesus intentionally, you know, became of no reputation. He intentionally endured incredible injustice. He intentionally took grief. And yet I, I want you to know that he, he endured in a way that today he, his name is above every name. He has been risen. He is high. He is lifted up. Praise his holy name. Now, what I want to share with you is just a few ways that Jesus taught us how to turn adversity into our advantage, how to, how to embrace the cross in a way that you get a crown, <laughs> how to go through a season we've been through and go through your worst and it make you your best. <laughs> Wouldn't that be incredible? It's God's promise. So here's, here's four things we see in the suffering of Jesus. Number one, we have the power to choose our response to adversity and suffering. In John 14, 30, Jesus is about to go to a you know, kangaroo trial. His best friend is about to cheat and betray him. And, and this is how he describes it, John 14, 30, if we have it. He says, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world. You know he's talking about Satan, right? For the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Say that. He has nothing in me. And this is so powerful. I almost hear Braveheart. They can take my life, but they can't take my freedom. You know, that whole thing. <laughs> He's saying, all hell's about to break loose. But I want you to know, it's not going to touch my joy, my character, or my victory. You see... It's not what happens to you. It's what you choose to let happen in you. What happens to you and what happens in you are two complete different things. The greatest power a human being has for freedom is not when they get a bunch of good things in their life, but when in spite of the suffering of their life, they declare by the power of Christ, God's bigger in me than all the hell that's coming against me. And I'm gonna be free. I'm not gonna be a victim. I'm gonna walk in faith, in favor. I, I listened to this incredible interview by Dr. Carolyn Leaf. She is, a, let me see if I can get this right, a cognitive neuroscientist, mental health, and mind expert. <laughs> and this was such a, a fascinating, one of the foremost leaders on the brain. And, and what she was saying is she studies the brain and she says, guess what? Your brain is always changing. <laughs> you are not born with the brain you have today. <laughs> You are creating your brain. You can reprogram your brain. Forget what they said about your IQ. You can get smarter. Don't believe anything they've said. And she said, in fact, they can prove it under a microscope that what people have thought that mental illness is like just a disease you catch. Or, or that if you've gone through traumas, that you automatically are gonna have depression, bipolar, uh, anxiety disorders. And she says they have studied this over and over. And she says what she has proven that in almost every situation, it is not what happens to the person, but it's what she called toxic reactions. It's, it's when we think, choose, and feel the lies that the world tells us. It's when we, when we choose to become bitter, when we choose to accept hopelessness, when we choose to think 
despair, it actually releases toxins into our brain. And it causes disease. It causes depression. And she said at the same time, when someone goes inside and they, and they choose to think, as Paul said, whatever is true, good, lovely. When they begin to choose and say, I, I, I'm not this victim, but God, you're going to use this. When they choose their response to the, the hurts, the brain begins to heal. It responds and, and I just love this because the Bible teaches us this. Uh, it, it teaches us that when we go through things, by the Spirit, by the Word inside of us, we don't have to be controlled by the darkness on the outside and the dark thoughts in our minds. Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor, and he, he talked about how so weird it was. Man, these Holocausts, it was all people were in despair, but there were a few people in the middle of the concentration camps that were doing things like giving their last piece of bread to people who, who were singing. And, and he wrote about his experience, and he, he wrote this. He says, when, when we, what we discovered is that when we can no longer change our situation, we could change ourselves. We are proof that there's a freedom that no one can take away, the freedom to choose our attitude in any given set of circumstances. Paul said it this way. I love this verse. If you go to Romans 8, 12, I just love this verse. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to what your sinful, sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. In other words, if you li listen to your unredeemed mind, if you repeat its lies, if you listen to those desires coming from your flesh, they will destroy you. But, how many are thankful for but? <laughs> but if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Amen. You see, there's not only darkness on the outside. How many know if you've got Jesus, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you, and greater is he that is in you. Do you understand that if you reach on the inside of you, there's peace. Greater is the peace inside of you than the anxiety that's coming again. Greater is God's ability to put in your mind redeeming thoughts, powerful thoughts, great decisions than, than the power of the enemy to try to destroy your life. It's within you. Draw it out. Draw it out. Say, God, I know I've got a lot coming against me, but I know who I am in Jesus. I know he is inside of me. He is my victory. I know I can overcome through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Secondly, Jesus taught us that we can choose to turn adversity into advantage if we Choose to see God's higher power that no matter what evil comes into our life, no matter what injustice, that God is still able to take that which is meant for evil and to use and turn it in a way that it turns to our advantage. This is so incredible. This is what Jesus did in John 19, 11. Jesus is facing Pilate, and Pilate says, you know, I have the power to crucify you, and I have the power to let you go. You know what Jesus says? No, you don't have any power over me except what was given by God. He said, yeah, yes, you, you are there on the stage, but there's someone greater than you, Pilate. Look at this verse in John, 19, uh, John 18, 11. Again, Jesus is that whole thing, you know, Peter. You remember when Peter chops off the high priest's servant's ear? I mean, no, Jesus really doesn't need you to defend him. It's, he really can handle it. But anyhow, but Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Now, this is crazy. I thought the cup was what the devil was giving him. What, what the soldiers were giving. He says, no, beyond all that, I believe that my father holds this cup. He's not causing all the evil, but he's deciding how it's gonna turn out. 
that he is in control. He is greater than the worst plot against me. He has put favor on my mind. Did you realize if you truly walk in the will of God that the game is fixed in your favor? <laughs> that God, in spite of what happens to you, is for you, so everybody else might as well be. In fact, let's just read what we call it our, our Romans 8.28 our victor's declaration, okay? Let's read it together. And we know that God causes everything. Let's start over because I don't think you quite believe it. So let's start over as loud as you can. And we know that God causes everything to work together for good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Wow, if that doesn't wake you up, church, you know, what, what news that is. God's fixed this game for you. He's on your side if you fulfill his purpose. That's why I said all through history, I, I read another study that's so interesting. It, it, it identified the greatest people in history, these champions. And you'd think, well, they had great backgrounds. They had great education. You know what they had in common? Most of them came from broken homes. They came from horrible circumstances. In fact, the adversity they went through, it was just that it made them stronger. It was just like they had to use the muscle of patience more. They had to use the muscle of determination. They had to use the muscle of forgiveness more. And, and what, what pushed them down ended up being the very thing that made them champions. And God says that's the same thing that can happen to you. Let me just read this. I thought this was pretty good and I had wanted to read it. It said, when someone is determined, what can stop him? Cripple him and you have a Sir Walter Scott. Put him in prison, you have John Bunyan. Bury him in the snows of Valley Forge and you have George Washington. Have him born in abject poverty and you have a Lincoln. Load him with bitter racial prejudice and you have a Disraeli and Martin Luther King Jr. Afflict him with asthma to where he almost chokes to death in his father's eyes and you have a Theodore Roosevelt. Crucify him. Put him in a grave. Lock him down. And three days later, he will rise to rule the world. You have Jesus Christ. I just wanted to say that because some of you look at the disadvantages of your life, but I want you to know when God is for you, he can redeem your life to its greatest purpose and highest destiny. Number three, we turn adversity into victory when we choose to completely surrender to God's will. When we choose to do the hard thing, to make the hard decisions of following Christ when it's not convenient, when we don't feel like it, when we rather have our own way. Can I just tell you this? Many people never experience all God has for them because they're trying to pay a cheaper price. They're trying to get a bargain. God, I want the Christian life, but hold the cross. No, thank you. God, I want a great marriage. And God says, okay, here's the cross. Deny yourself. You might need to get married. I remember when Sharon and I, in early, we were going through a hardship. Our marriage was separating. And, and, and I said, God, heal my marriage. He says, yeah, you're going to have to call and get counseling. I said, Can I, I don't want counseling. God said, then you don't want healing. And I had to humble myself. And, and, and how many know it wasn't a good cross, but guess what? God healed our marriage. There, there's a, I, I remember when I first became saved, I, I wanted to be an on-fire Christian, but I didn't want to get embarrassed. I wanted to go to school and just kind of hide it from people. You know, I didn't want anyone to mock me. I didn't want to be a Jesus freak at that time. You know, I wanted to be a Lady Claire all Christian. Only God knew for sure, but whatever it was. And I remember God says, you can have that. But if you want a shortcut, you will never have my full blessing on your life. And I realized I'd have to take up the cross. I remember the day I decided, I'm gonna let this whole school know. I wore my Jesus shirt. I took my Bible. I just told everybody, yes, I am one. You know, whatever it was. Guess what? From that day forward, everything changed. Why? 
Because when you take the cross, you always get the crown. When you choose the hard thing. See, the world says choose the easy thing. But someone said you can pay now and play later. Or you can play now and you will pay later. When you're hard on yourself, life becomes easy. When you're easy on yourself, life becomes harder. You know what I'm saying? When you truly say, I'm going to pay the price. Great marriages cost tremendous sacrifice. Everybody wishes for one. But who wants to pay for one? I mean, great businesses. A lot of people say, man, I wish I could have a great thing at work and people respect. I wish I could have God use me in a great way. You can. Take up your cross. Ask this incredible question. God, what is the cross that you want me to carry so I can have the crown you want me to have? What is the cross? You know, Jesus comes to the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22, 42. He's lived a great life. You know, the Bible says Jesus could have called 10,000 angels. He could have said, forget this dying. (laughs) I'm going to get out of here. And so he's in this garden. And the Bible says he's sweating drops of blood. That means he is so stressed out that the blood vessels are popping. He is suffering such anguish. Why? Not just because he was going to go to a cross, but his father, he would be separated. He would literally go to hell for us. And as he's there, everything in his natural just kind of pushed back. I mean, he knows the, the wrestling match some of you are going through. But look at what this verse says. Look, 22, 42. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Someone said, when did Jesus really die? Was it on the cross? No, it was right there. He went to the cross, but he really died when he totally gave up his will. Some of you here today, God is calling you to be something radical. (laughs) What if you actually not only kind of gave your religious service, you gave up your options. (laughs) You gave up your future. See, the devil always tells you, man, if you make a radical commitment to Jesus, man, it's going to ruin your life. What a lie. The greatest joy comes from the greatest surrender. (laughs) What is the cross? Maybe for some of you, You're saying, God, I need sobriety. And God says, the cross is transparency. You're going to have to get the secret out. You got to have to, I don't want want sobriety, but not the cross. No, you got to take the cross. Maybe you want peace with God. You're going to need to confess. You're going to need to repent. Maybe you need to heal a relationship. You've got anxiety. It might be God says the cross is you need to forgive. You need to get rid of grudges. I don't want to get rid of the grudge. Yeah, but you never will have freedom. But if you'll take up the cross, if you'll nail that hatred to the cross, if you'll say, God, I give up the right. You know, before you give your whole life to Jesus, you think you have an option. I like those persons. I like that person. I hate that. But when you come and give all your options, you don't get to choose who you love. Because he is Lord. You say, well, I I really want... I really want family to work. And God says, will you take up your cross for your family? Maybe you got to work less. Maybe you got to just lay aside so much of your busyness. I I want, God, I want to really get this bad habit. Well, you're going to need to be accountable to somebody. I want to grow as a Christian. You do? Well, you got to be consistent. You're going to have to take up the cross of being consistent. And every day, growing in the word and saying, "I'm, I'm all in. I'm not sort of in. Sunday I'm in. Monday I'm not in. Tuesday I'm kind of in. And Friday I'm, whoa, I'm out. But no, I'm in. I'm in. I'm all in. That's the cross. And then finally, God turns adversity into victory when we choose the higher purpose for why God allows us to suffer. Let's look at this verse, Hebrews 12, 
too, and I just, I just love it because it explains, Jesus explains how he was able to endure the cross. And he just says it so beautiful. He says, you know, he's asking in the previous verse, he's saying, you know, you got to lay aside the baggage. <laughs> you know, get the junk out of the trunk, you know, get it out and get serious about God. And, and the question is, well, how do you do this? And he says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. What I want you to see here is the joy. He says, Jesus, how did you do that? He said, it was the joy. Do you know what his joy was? You were his joy. He saw you. He saw that Owen will get to be in heaven. He saw that Leah will get to have a relationship with God if he goes through with it. He saw that your marriage could be healed, that your future could change that you could live free from those tormenting spirits. He says, yes, yes, Father. You see, the highest purpose of your life is not to get and be comfortable and have more. and That, that is not what will bring you joy. I know you think that's what brings you joy because every commercial on television says if you have this kind of deodorant, you will be joyful or something. I don't know. It's weird. But God says there's only one thing that will make you normal. Because when you give your life, other people will have a chance to have hope. And nothing that you will ever do in your life will matter. You know, when I see my daughter Heidi, and they're going to Zambia. You know, we can talk about all the hard things that they'll have to go through, but when they see one of their young lions, one of those orphan boys, whose lives totally changed around, you, you'll see the joy, the tears. They'll say, I wouldn't trade this for anything. When you look back at your life, and you see people's lives changed, and you someday, you go to heaven and you see this person who comes and says, thank you, you know, I would have died and gone to hell if it wasn't for you. You will have such joy. You'll have such meaning. You know, it's just so contrary to the world. I'll take these people on these mission trips and for two weeks, and they'll spend lots of money, like as much as it would have taken. They could have gone on a cruise. <laughs> and they'll go to some place where, you know, there's no air conditioning and they get bitten by mosquitoes all night and they'll, you know, the, the food, you know, they have to take, anyhow, they got all kinds of issues. But they'll go there and they'll serve these kids and they'll share in Jesus and people will come to the Lord and they'll get jet lag and they'll be like, whoa, 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 and then they'll come back and they'll say, oh my God, that was the best two weeks of my life. When can we go again? It's weird. But you see, you weren't wired to be selfish. You were wired to give your life. And when you do, it all makes sense. It's who you're supposed to be. You say, well, I can't do that. And Jesus would always, you know, he would always say the cross. People would say, okay, I'll follow you, but first let me go bury my father. I'll follow you, but first let me pay off the house. I'll follow you, but... And they have a whole list. And Jesus would just shake his head. But every once in a while, some weird person like Peter, James, and John, they just say, what the heck? I'm going to sell out for you, Jesus. There goes my nets. <laughs> I'll probably get crucified, <laughs> whatever. But I'm with you, Jesus. You say, well, that's too hard for me. And can I tell you, 
If you say that, I know exactly how you feel. If anyone here feels like, I don't know if I can do it. I, being a Christian is too hard. Guess what? You're in good company. How many have said, I felt the same thing? I, I, just, I still feel it every day. But what I want you to hear is what Jesus says he is. He is the initiator. He is the author. And he is the perfecter of this kind of faith. When you don't have it, when you say, I don't even know if I can surrender, but you say, God, help me be willing, he will give you the grace. When Corey Tim Boom, the famous pastor that whose sister was, was killed by Nazis in Germany, met the man who killed his, her sister. God said to forgive him, and she said, I could never forgive him. And God says, I know you can't, but just stretch out your hand. And, and as she did, God came. Love came. Well, you and I say, I could never do that. I could never be like that. I know you can't. Neither could I, and neither can I. Like this week, the Lord spoke to me about doing something. I said, no, no. <laughs> I want a shortcut. Let's, let's give me a deal, God, <laughs> you know. Anybody ever bargain with God? Really, really a bad idea. <laughs> it's too hard. Hey, try a cross, crown of thorns, 39 lap. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Forgot about that one. And all of a sudden, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Dale, you're not saying yes to that hard thing. You're saying yes to Jesus. You're saying, yes, Jesus, be strong with me. Yes, Jesus, be the one who works in me to will and do. Be the one who gives me such love and such hope and passion that I could live a life of sacrifice. These little kids were in Sunday school and the teacher was teaching on the verse Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light and, and said, who can tell me what a yoke is? And a boy said, well, a yoke is a heavy thing that animals have to wear on their neck. And the teacher asked, well, what is the yoke God puts on us? And a little girl raised her hand and said, oh, God's yoke is when he puts his arms around our hearts and necks and lifts us up and gives us the power with his strength to go where we have to go and to be who we need to be. He is the grace giver. He will change you. He will give you a heart of a champion if you will just turn to him and ask him for grace. I'm going to just ask the worship team to come and invite you to pray with me. One of the things I'd invite you to do, and one of the reasons I wanted to mention this card, is some of you may just want to write a request and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? This is the cross I think God's telling me to take up, and I'll privately, confidentially pray for you. I think God's telling me that I need to take up the cross of forgiving someone. I need to take up the cross of getting out of a wrong relationship. I need to take up the cross of fully joining in to the family of God and starting to serve the Lord again. Whatever it is, this is the day. As we squeeze, stand, and let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I just want to pray for this dear family. You know, life has been hard, we have lots of disappointments. We have lots of hardships. It's really easy to get bitter. But we want to make another choice today. We want to get better. We want to choose to respond to you so that the worst things that happen end up bringing out the best in us. We choose, Lord, today to draw from the Holy Spirit, not from our flesh, not from the world. We choose to say, be in charge of our hearts, Holy Spirit. We choose to nail to the cross with you our anger, our rage, our lust, whatever it is. 
tries to keep us victims of this world, living a false story. We choose, Lord, by your grace to give our will to you. To just pray this, Father, not what I want, but what you want. Maybe you could just pray it with me right now. Father, not what I want, but what you want. I'm at a crossroads, Lord, my will and your will. I want to leave my will behind and take up my cross. I wonder how many here would say, I want to choose today to carry the cross so that I can have the crown. If you would, just pray this prayer with me right now. Maybe some of you here, you've never come to meet Christ. This is how you do it. and Maybe you need to rededicate your life to God. I don't know, but if you will give your will to God, this is what changes everything. It happens at the very center of your heart. So pray like this. If you, why don't we just pray it all together? Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross. I believe that you died and rose again. Thank you for paying for my sins. I accept your forgiveness. And now, Lord, I give my will to you. Be the boss of my life. Take charge. I choose the cross so I can have the crown. Now, wherever the Holy Spirit, listen right now, the Holy Spirit's going to speak to you. Just so say, Holy Spirit, what cross are you telling me to pick up today before I go? What cross is it? You know, it could be anything right now. Just It's the cross for, about my health, my finances, my marriage, my relationships with people in the world, my, my sobriety, my, my, these habits. I just choose it, Lord. And I know that I'm not strong enough. But I believe you can give me the strength. You can change my will with the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord.